I got a word. You ready to hear it? It's been a while, but I'm ready. So if you got your Bibles, I want you to take them out right now, and I want you to turn to 2 Kings 19. This has been an amazing season coming off a of sabbatical, and if you've been around, uh, we've been talking a lot about winning. Um, I, I, just, I just believe what John 10.10 10 says is true. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus said, I have come to give life and life more abundantly. The devil wants me to lose. Jesus wants me to win. So if he came to give me life and life more abundantly, then that means when I believe in him, I become a what? A winner. How many of you believe you're a winner out there? Some of you may feel like you're losing, but don't let how you feel dictate who you are. You are a winner. Amen? So I want, I want to talk about winning because, man, this is a season of winning. And I don't ever believe that the season has to end because I believe you always win when you have the right perspective. Amen? So I, I came off of sabbatical and I've been talking a lot about Hezekiah because he was one of the greatest winners in Bible history. Um, and I've been preaching messages. And can we give it up one time for Pastor Joanne who preached the paint off the walls last week? Man, even when, even when you feel like you're losing, man, you, you, you're still winning in Jesus' name. Amen? I, I, I love that. So I, I'm going I'm to keep it going because I, I really like Hezekiah. And I know it's been a couple weeks since we talked about it, but I'm going right back. I'll catch you up if you've been missing it. Hey, if you're online, love you, man. Make sure you get your Bibles out. Any cool church app users out there? Come on. Where, where they at? Where, come on. Awesome. 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 Who got a real Bible? Oh, hold it up for me. Hold it up. Oh, I like big Bibles and I cannot lie. Come on. I love that. I love that. Who been coming to UBC for the last couple weeks? It's getting crazy. Give it up for Rick one time. Rick is our head production uh, back here. He's the, he's the guy, lead storyteller. We also call him Rick the Jeweler. He be dropping jewels, but I'm coming back this Wednesday, and we jumping right back into Matthew chapter 15. Amen? And if you've been joining us online for that, we love you as well. 2 Kings chapter 19, verses 14 through 19 read like this. Oh, my goodness. Here it is. Hezekiah received a letter from the messengers and read it. Then he went up to the temple of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. Somebody say spread it out. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord. I love this. Lord, God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made the heavens and the earth. That's a good place to say amen. Give ear, Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, Lord, and see. Listen to the words Sennacherib, that's the king of Assyria, has sent to ridicule the living God. It is true, Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste to these nations in their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them, for they were not gods, only wood and stone fashioned by human hands. Verse 19, if this don't get you to say amen, I don't know what will. Now, the Lord our God, deliver us from his hand so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, Lord, are God. If you believe it, say amen. amen. I'm going to need somebody to preach with me today. I'm an old school Pentecostal boy. Let me tell you something. I like, I like when people shout back at me. So you might say amen. You might say hallelujah. You might say that's good, pastor. You might even say preach it baldy. But on the count of three, I need you to yell something back at me so I know that you actually hear me, that you with me, and that you agree with me. Here we go. One, two, three. We're getting a lot more respectful. I heard a lot less preach at Baldies. I love it. I'm ready to preach today. So if you're taking notes on this message, another one about Hezekiah, I've entitled it this, Pray to Win. Hanai, thank you for being with me. Pray to win. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for this day, for this is the day that you have made. God, let us rejoice and be glad. God, I thank you that before the earth began to spin on its axis, you knew each and every person that was going to be in this place today. God, I pray that I would lie down 
and that you would rise up. Don't let these words be my own, but let them come from you, God. You, you, I just pray that before this is all said and done, somebody in this room would hear the one name that is above every name, the name of Jesus. And they will have a personal relationship with him. God, I pray for the one that needs to hear this word the most. God, for the person out there, maybe in this room or online that's discouraged, has anxiety, that doesn't know what to do next, that is praying but feels like their prayers are hitting the ceiling. God, I pray that this message will resonate in their heart. And I pray that they would know that you are for them. You are with them. And you alone deserve all the glory. So God, may people meet you before it's all said and done. We love you, we praise you, and we give this time of worship back to you. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody set. Everybody set. Take about five seconds and give Jesus some praise today. Come on. Pray to win. So, the first message I came back uh, from sabbatical with, I, I, I just entitled this, I said, all, all we do is win. How many, how many winners we got out there? All we do is win. And we opened it up talking about the life of Hezekiah. And in Hezekiah, he, he, was one of the great, he was one of the greatest kings to ever live. One of the greatest kings to ever live. As a matter of fact, he was also one of the most successful kings to ever live. He had an uncommon favor on his life. And, and the thing about Hezekiah, the Bible says this about him. It says that he trusted the Lord and he obeyed him. And because he trusted the Lord and obeyed him, the Bible says this in 2 Kings 18, 7. It says, the Lord was with him and he was successful in whatever he undertook. How many want to be successful in whatever you do? All right, I'm going to try that again because I thought I was going to get 100% on that. How many want to be successful in everything they do? Praise God, we're awake this morning. Hallelujah. I want to be successful in whatever I do. So the key to that, according to what happens with Hezekiah, is that he trusted God and he obeyed him. How many of you know you can trust God and not obey him and you can obey God and not trust him? You need both. That is the winning formula. Trust plus obedience equals success. Amen? And in the second week, we talked about, man, what... what you know you're a winner, but like, what do you do, man, when you feel like you're, you're losing? He Hezekiah, man, he was a great man, and he was the, 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 the king of the southern kingdom of Judah, which capital was Jerusalem. And the northern kingdom of Israel had already been conquered by the Assyrians, and uh, its people had been sent into exile. So now Hezekiah is held up in his stronghold in Jerusalem. The Assyrians are about to conquer their territory, and the Assyrian king uh, uh, sends an Assyrian field commander to Hezekiah to literally intimidate him and talk junk. The field commander comes up to Hezekiah's homies, and he's like, hey, we're going to beat y'all so bad. And this is true. I'm not making this up. We're going to beat y'all so bad, when we're done with you, you're going to eat your own feces and drink your own urine. That's in the Bible. It's gross, but it's true. That's how bad we're going to beat y'all. So Hezekiah's boys, they depressed. They ripped their clothes. Ah, Lord Jesus, what's going on? Ripping their clothes was a sign of anguish, uh, anguish where you felt like, man, you might as well just kill me. Like, I, I might as well die. Like, it's the worst anguish that you could feel. So when the, when the, when the Assyrian field commander threatens them while he's standing in front of them. They don't moan. They don't wail. They don't tear their clothes. When they stand in front of them, they're, he, they're silent. They're dead silent. They don't say anything. Why? Because Hezekiah was like, I don't care what he tells you. I don't care how bad it looks, how much he tries to intimidate you. Say nothing. Don't say a thing. And I love this, 2 Kings 18.36, it says, But the people remained silent and said nothing in reply because the king had commanded, do not answer him. What did Hezekiah know that his people didn't know? Hezekiah knew there is no reasoning with the enemy, so winners don't even dignify the enemy with a response. Some of y'all talking way too much to the devil. You you talking way too much to people that don't even deserve your response. Let them talk. You stay silent and let your sacrifice say more than your words can. So today I want to kind of take a turn in this story. That was that that was Second Kings eighteen. So I just caught you up on that chapter. Now we in Second Kings 
19. And before I, I, I dig in to 2 Kings uh, 19, can I, can I just tell you a little quick story that happened to me recently? Kind of helped set the premise for this thing. So if you know me long enough, or you're just meeting me for the first time, I'm going I'm to tell you something that, that is true about me. I am a really competitive person. I hate to lose. I really do. And one game I really hate to lose is spades. <laughs> me and my wife was playing spades yesterday, and we were on the same team, and I was still getting mad. Like, we were winning, but I'm like, watch the board! <laughs> Stay bogus! Because I, I, like, I don't, man, I'm from Carroll City. I don't, when it comes to I don't play with my spades, man. Right? So last weekend, I, I, was, I was hanging out with some family, and one of my family members who will remain nameless <laughs> is not really the best at spades, but they trying to learn. And I say, you know what, I'm going to be helpful. You know, I'm a, I'm a good family member. Let me help them out a little bit. So the family member, I was kind of coaching them in the background of how to play the game while they was playing it. And the people didn't mind. Like, you know, it wasn't like a, a, a real game where you flipping tables and stuff. It was kind of just like a casual game. They wanted her to learn, so it was what it was. So she has this hand. Oh, y'all want me to say who it is? Oh, her. There's a lot of hers in my family. Y'all petty. Okay, so... Anyway, she, <laughs> she identifies as she, she uh, was playing, and I'm like with her, and, and she, get, she got two cards left in her hand. Two cards left in her hand, and, and, and she's like, hey, T, which one should I play? And I look at her, and I say, I say these words, and the people around the table already know what I'm about to say. I said, play to win. I said, play to win, because she was considering playing a card that would not only have lost the hand, it would have on the next hand forced her to renege. <laughs> ask your space playing friends will renege me. So I said, hey, play to win. Took the card out of her hand, if she was supposed to take out, she won the, 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 the round, and then she ended up winning the hand. Why? Because she played to win. You know, as obvious as that sounds, play to win, it got me thinking about how some people play this game called life. <laughs> Many people don't play this game of life to win, they play it to survive. They, they play this game to survive. And I ain't going to lie, as much as I play spades, there have been hands that I've been dealt where I'm literally just playing to survive. You ever get a real bad hand in spades? And you look at your partner, how many books you got? <laughs> What's your partner say? We go on board. You say, what's board? Board is when you only believe you can make four books out of the 13 books. The problem with that is, you are already saying, my hand is trash. You are already saying, we're going to lose this hand, but instead of making it a total loss, it's going to be like a minor loss instead of a major loss. Bo going bored is admitting defeat. When you get a bad hand in space, you are no longer playing to win. You are playing to survive. And this is what happens with so many people. They get a hand in life. And they look at their hand. And they say, man, I can't do nothing with this hand. I'm just playing to survive. You, you say, ah, oh, you know, Pastor, man, people feel like it all the time. There, there, there's folks, and I don't know what, what cards you've been dealt. I don't know what your, your life looks like. Maybe you've been dealt the card of being a single parent. And you just feel like, man, I got to raise a kid by myself. He crazy. You feel like you're playing not to win, but you're playing to survive. Maybe your marriage started out great, but now you're struggling, man. 
Like y'all getting on each other's nerves. Counseling ain't helping. You feel like praying ain't helping. Y'all don't even like, like, like forget love. Y'all don't even like each other anymore. You ain't playing to win. You playing to survive. You, you working. You working hard. You got two, three jobs. And for whatever reason, because inflation is crazy, cost of living is higher than any of us have ever experienced in any lifetime, you ain't, you ain't able to put money away in a savings account. You working check to check. You robbing Peter to pay Paul. You are playing to survive. Or maybe because of lack of education or maybe because a lack of resources, you feel like, man, I can't get the job. I can't get ahead. I don't even know the next step to move, the next move to make, man. I can't, I can't play to win. I feel like I'm playing to survive. Maybe for some strange reason, there could be a million reasons. Maybe I, I know people like this. You got a court case out there that's impending. And you don't know how the judge is going to rule. But you and your mind like, man, there's no way he's going to rule in my favor, man. I need, I need a miracle. I, I, I need something out there. Like, this, this thing could ruin me. It could be a child support case. It, it could be an assault case. It could, be, it could be all kinds of cases out there that you got in front of you. And you're like, man, I don't feel like I'm playing to win. I feel like I'm just pr- playing to survive. Maybe, maybe you've been to the doctor recently, man. You thought you was good, and you got a report you weren't ready for. They did a scan that you didn't think. You, you, you needed. They, 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 saw, they saw a shadow on the scan that looks unusual. They saw different masses on the scan that are not a normal part of your body. And they say it's inconclusive. We're not sure. We're going to have to run more tests. And that fear starts to build up in you because now you've been dealt a card where you feel like you are uncertain about your own health and you don't feel like you're playing to win. You feel like you are playing to Maybe you're depressed, man. Oh, man. Like, man, no, like everybody abandoned me, man. Like, no, no, nobody's for me. Nothing is going my way. Should I even still be here anymore? You're not playing to win. You are playing to. Maybe you got anxiety about all the stuff that you're seeing in this world. It's earthquakes in various places, man. Stock market is crazy. People identifying as everything. I don't know which way is up anymore. I feel like everything is crazy. And like you scared to even leave your house at this point because you got so much anxiety. You're not playing to win. You're playing to maybe you're frustrated. Or maybe, just maybe, you're like, man, I have no purpose. And if I do, I don't know what it is. I don't feel like I'm playing to win. I feel like I'm playing to survive. A lot of people, they they don't play to win. They play just to make it to tomorrow. They play to survive. They don't play to win. They, they They play so they don't lose as bad as they're losing. They don't, they, don't, they, don't, they don't play to win, they play to survive. And as crazy as that sounds, I know people play that way, but there's a lot of people that pray that way. They pray. They don't pray to win, they just pray to survive. God, please let me make it through today. God, 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 please just, 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 I pr- pr- please let the judge rule in my favor this one more time. Please, I promise I'm going to be all right. God, God, please just, 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 just give me the money just to, just, just to pay, just, just to pay my phone, or, or just give me the money just, just to pay my car so I don't repossess it. God, just, 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 I, just you, you're not praying to win. You're praying to survive. And the truth is, praying to survive might get you through something, but praying to win will get you to someone. There's a difference. Why, why is that true? Because when I pray to survive, I'm requesting God's help for a moment just to get me beyond the situation. But when I pray to win, my prayer brings me to God because I stop praying for what I want and I start praying for his will in every area of my life, even if it means I have to stay in this situation for his will to be done. Big difference. I could pray, God, just, 
man, let me, let me get this my way. Or I could say, God, you do this your way, even if it means I still have to stay here. That's two different kinds of prayers. Qualify that with the Bible, Jesus. He gets into the garden, and this is the most bipolar prayer I've ever heard Jesus pray. But he prays it with intention. Look at what Matthew 26, 39 says. He went a little farther and bowed his face to the ground praying, my father, if it is possible. Isn't to God all things possible? Jesus prayed this. If it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet, I want your will to be done, not mine. This is the tale of the all God, all man Jesus. The first half of this prayer, it seems like he prays with his flesh. God, um, is there a way you could like not have me go to the cross to fulfill the salvation of all mankind? That sounds like a survival prayer. The second part, hey, I digress. Not my will, let your will be done. That sounds like a winning prayer. Tale of two prayers in one prayer. Pray by Jesus to let us understand that our humanity is not a mistake. When you feel that way, there's a reason for it. You are human, but Jesus tries to show us you can't stay there. You can't stay in how you feel. You got to pray past it. So you cannot just pray to survive. You must pray to win. A winning prayer is the prayer that invokes the will of God in your life regardless of your personal benefit because it's not about personal benefit. It's about personal relationship with God. Personal benefit says, God, give me off this cross. Personal relationship says, God, I want it your way. Why? Because I want to be closer to you. I want to make you happy. I, I, I want you to be proud of me. So I'm going to do it. You're, when, you, when you pray to win, your relationship with God grows. When you pray to survive, you're just praying for yourself. You're not praying for your relationship. You're praying for yourself. So when I pray my relationship with God, I need you to hear this, is so solid because I want what he wants because what he wants is always best for me. Amen? So how, how do you pray to win? Three quick things and then we're out of here, okay? The first thing is this. If you want to pray to win, the first thing you must do is spread it out. Spread it out. What? Let's see how Hezekiah can help us with this. Hezekiah, he, he hears this bad report from his homies um, about that this, this, this Assyrian field commander is telling him, hey, man, y'all going to eat feces, y'all going to drink urine. His boys run back to him. Hezekiah, man, hey, they going to kill us, man. It, it, we're, we're done. Hezekiah, in anguish, he himself now tears his clothes. He's like, ah, can't believe you, God. You, you, God, why are we here right now? What, what's, going, what's going on? You know, he's praying. He's praying those survival prayers. He says, all right, this is what I need y'all to do. Go to the prophet Isaiah and see what he got to say about this whole thing. Listen, because Isaiah, I know, I know he's, he's like really, really connected to God. So let's see what Isaiah says. 2 Kings 19, 5 through 7. Isaiah said to them, tell your master, this is what the Lord says. I love this. Do not be afraid of what you have heard. That's the word for somebody in this place today. Some of y'all heard something that has terrified you. But God is not giving you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Don't let the words frighten you. Let God inspire you to know that you are bold. You are courageous. You are strong. And if you have him, there is nothing to be afraid of. If you believe that, say amen. Don't be afraid of what you've heard. Those words with which the underlings... He's like the peasants, the servants, the underlings of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Listen, exclamation point. When he hears a certain report, I will make him want to return to his, whole, his own country, and there I will have him cut down with a sword. Isaiah was like, hey, let me, let me bring this up to speed in, in, in the NIV, the Negro International Version for you. Isaiah was like, God's going to deal with that fool. God's got it. 
Stop, stop stressing out about it. God, God's got it. So he hears this word, and you would think, like, whew, the prophet said it. I know he connected with God. He told me that. I'm going I'm to I'm be good. So not only does King Hezekiah hear this, the Assyrian field commander, who is now a, a, away somewhere else, he catches on to this word, too. And he's so petty, he now sends a letter to Hezekiah to continue to threaten him with words written on papyrus because he's like, if I can't be in his face and threaten him, I'm going to threaten him from a distance. I don't care. I'm going to keep on trying to intimidate him. And he sends a word. And look at what Hezekiah does this time when he gets this word. He does not tear his clothes. His posture changes because I believe now he has a little more confidence knowing that God is on his side and that this is not going to end well for this Assyrian uh, 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 king. And he gets this, this message from this guy. 2 Kings 19, 14 through 15. Hezekiah received a letter from the messengers and read it. Listen to this. Then he went up to the temple of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. Whew. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord. Lord, listen to this. The God of Israel. Enthroned between the cherubim. I got to say it with my chest because that's how you pray that. Right? You alone are God over all kingdoms of the earth. And you have made heaven and earth. Hezekiah gets a word from the Lord. Then he gets a word from the enemy. And then he takes that word, spreads it out in the, in the courts of the temple. And then he prays to the Lord. He prays to the Lord. Hezekiah gets bad news. He goes to the temple, takes the letter. Could you imagine this? And he spreads the letter out. All the nonsense that the enemy has said to him. He spreads it out before the Lord. Here's the problem. I know too many people that spread out their issues in front of the wrong people. And you mad you feel like you ain't getting a response from God. Because instead of spreading it out before him, you don't spread it out in front of everybody else. You spread it out to nosy people. Why are they talking about me? Because you gave them something to talk about. Why'd you tell them? You ain't need to tell them. You just, I just needed to vent. You vented to the wrong one. You, you, you spread it out to people with issues. Honestly, a lot of us spread people spread stuff out to people with issues that we believe are worse than us because it makes us feel better about the situation we're in. So let me ask you this. You think a bunch of people with issues going to be able to help one another? All you're going to do is cultivate more issues. You're spreading it out to the wrong people. Here's the one that gets me. People spread their stuff out to people who lack faith. If I need a miracle, why am I talking to a faithless person? I need my faith to unite with somebody else's faith, to unite with somebody else's faith. I, this is why church is important. I need a community. If something is going on with me, I don't just tell any and everybody. I tell my church family. I tell my community. There are people in this room that I trust, that are prayer warriors in my life, that know how to pray, that know my secrets, that know my issues, and know the things that I need prayer for. And I know that they got faith, but not just any faith. It ain't even mustard seed faith. They got faith more than a mustard seed. They got that mountain moving type of faith. So when I link up my issues with their faith, then my issues are no longer an issue, but they are a platform that God will use to be able to show the world who he is through my problem. If you believe it, say amen. I tell my stuff to people of faith, but some people, they want to spread it out to people that just want to see them fail. They're my trusted friend. No, they're close to you because if you fall, they're going to feel better about themselves. <laughs> Some people spread their faith to all kinds of nonsense people. You spread it out to fortune tellers. You spread it out to, to witch doctors. You spreading it out to voodoo Not me, pastor. Maybe somebody in your family does. 
I'm an island boy, man. I'm not going to act like that stuff is foreign to us. It's all kind of stuff going on in people's household. Voodoo, Santeria, all that stuff, man. You spreading your issues out. Oh, you take it to the doctor, you give them a little nice fee, and then they'll make sure the demons are clear from your house for a year. What kind of nonsense is that? You better start spreading your stuff out before them. I'm going to let you know everything so now you can tell me my future. They can't tell you your future because they didn't write it. You, you, you spread, they, we spread our stuff, out, our, our stuff out in front of false gods. We got the shrines and the trinkets and the altars in our home that are not altars of God. You're burning 57 candles, about to light, light your house on fire. There's something that ain't God. There's something that ain't God. It's a shrine that you set up that is not God. You think God needs you to burn a candle for him to be who he is? Now, I, I, I like candles in my home, but it's because I want it to smell good. But not because I've created this nonsense altar that the God that I worship does not need a medium of the flame or the smoke for his presence to be felt in my home. The God I serve says he's enthroned on my praise. Some of you lighting fires with a match when you need to be lighting fires with your mouth. Ah, y'all don't want me to preach today. The God that I serve says I inhabit the praises of my people. I don't know who's sitting in here today, but some of y'all are way too quiet in God's house on a Sunday. You waiting for a miracle. You waiting for a breakthrough. You waiting for a chain to break, but you want to sit in your seat silent and expect God to show up when he says, no, 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 no. I'm waiting for somebody to praise so I can sit in the midst of their praise and be Jehovah Jireh, their provider. If you believe it, say amen. I'm a problem when I get some rest. That's why the enemy don't want me to get rest. Because he, he mm, mm, mm. You're spreading your stuff out in front of the wrong people. So my thing is, if you're going to spread it out, let's spread it out to who Hezekiah says, the Lord, the Lord God of Israel enthroned between the cherubim. But you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth and you have made heaven and earth. If you're going to spread it out, let's break that verse down for a little bit. Spread it out before the Lord. Isaiah called, recalls this same story in Isaiah 37 and he doesn't say he does not say the Lord God of Israel. You know what he says? He says the Lord of hosts. You know what that means? The Lord of armies. If you're going to spread it out, don't just spread it out in front of the Lord. Spread it out in front of the Lord of armies, which means when you got a problem, he can dispatch because he is commander and chief and army of angels to deal with whatever is going on. I don't just spread it out before anybody. I spread it out in front of the commander, but let's take it further. He says enthroned between the cherubim. If you look at the Ark of the Covenant, there is a cherubim, an angelic creature on one side, another cherubim, another angelic creature on the other side. But what the Hebrews would have said is that that spot in the middle is called the mercy seat. Why? Because it is the seat of judgment. So here's what I want you to know. Not only do I spread it out before the commander in chief, I spread it out before the only righteous judge that continues to show me mercy and can judge right in my case at all times. But I'm going to take it a little further than that because he goes on to say, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. When you have soul authority and you have soul power, what does our earth call you? It does not call you a president. It calls you a king. He is the king, but not just any king. According to this, he is the king of kings. So I don't just spread it out to the commander. I don't just spread it out to 
the judge. I spread it out to the king. But then he finally goes on to say this final piece. He says, and you have made the heavens and the earth. He is not just a commander. He is not just a judge. He is not just a king. He is the creator of all things. So when I lay my problems out, I take them to the chief. I take them to the judge. I take them to the creator and I take them to the king of kings and the lord of lords because if he made it then he has governance and authority and dominion over it if you believe it say amen stop taking your problems and your issues and spreading them out before everybody spread them out before the commander Spread them out before the judge. Spread them out before the king. Spread them out before the creator of all things. Don't just spread them out. Speak the truth. Speak the truth. 2 Kings 19, 16 through 18. Give ear, Lord. And here, this is the second part of Hezekiah's prayer. Open your eyes, Lord, and see. Listen to the words Sennacherib, this is the king of Assyria, has sent to ridicule the living God. Look at your neighbor and say, living God. I want you to catch that distinction. Verse 17, it is true, Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste these nations and their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them. For they were not gods, but only wood and stone fashioned by human hands. So when Hezekiah talks about the God, the commander, the judge, the, 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 the king, <laughs> talks about the creator, he says he is living. But when he talks about the guys that the Assyrians have already beat, he says, man, they nothing but wood and stone. He says, they're, they're nothing. What is Hezekiah doing? He's comparing the false gods of wood and stone to the one true living God that knows all, sees all, and can do all things. I love it because in verse 17, it starts says, it is true. What's he doing? Let me let you understand the reality of the situation. That maybe the Assyrians, yeah, they have beat other people. But it's because their gods were dead, not alive. Let me speak the truth on that matter. Right? Here's what you have to understand. When you compare any enemy to our God, you realize how powerless that enemy actually really is. Living God, gods of wood and stone. They cannot compare to the one true God that lives, right? That's why people say things. When you tell the truth about what an enemy is, you take his power away. This is why people say things like, tell the truth. Y'all knew what I was going to say. The truth shames him because it exposes what he really is. A coward. A punk. A, a, a powerless, defeated person. So we tell the truth about him to expose how weak he really is and to exalt how great God really is. This, this man, I, I love this so much because too many of us have fueled the enemy's lies with power, but telling the truth takes the power away, y'all. This is why scripture is so important because when the enemy lies to you, it says you're a loser. Speak the truth of Romans 8.37 that says, No, in all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. So say this, I'm not a loser. I'm more than a conqueror. Man, you should puff out your chest when you say that. I'm not a loser. Say it with some bass in your voice. Ladies, I'm not a loser. I'm more than a conqueror. 
When the enemy lies and says, you have no purpose, speak the truth of Ephesians 2.10 that says, you are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things that he planned for us long ago. Say, I'm not a person without purpose. I'm a masterpiece. See, some of you see, some say, listen, I got a purpose. I'm a masterpiece. Don't let the enemy lie to you and say God doesn't care about you. Speak the truth of Psalms 23 that says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thine are with me. Thy rod and thy staff comfort me. Say, God cares about me. He is my shepherd. God cares about me. He is my shepherd. This is why you need to read your Bible, because God has more truth than the enemy has lies. Don't take my word for it. Take God's word for it. I talk to people all the time. All they do is repeat the lies of the enemy. I'm like, you know God's got way more truth than the enemy has lies, right? It's got way more truth for you. Speak the truth and take away the power of the lies. Because when you speak the truth of God in any situation, the lies of the enemy lose their power. And lastly, cite the source. Spread it out. Speak the truth. Cite the source. Is this helping somebody today? 2 Kings 19, 19. This is the verse. Now the Lord our God, now, Lord, our God, deliver us from his hand so that, this is the important part, all the kingdoms of earth may know that you alone, Lord, are God. On period. <laughs> deliver us from his hand so that all the kingdoms on earth may know that you alone, Lord. I, I love the end of this prayer because, yeah, it's on period, but, and I'm not looking at the punctuation at the end of that sentence. That entire sentence, that entire statement is an exclamation point. It ain't a comma and it ain't a question. He says, now, Lord our God, deliver us from his hand so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, Lord, are God. God, like, Hezekiah is literally saying, like, man, put some respect on God's name. Not respect for all the dignified. Put some respect. Put some respect on his name. Put some respect on my God's name. This prayer is not, God, listen to it. God, do this so I can get what I want. No, it's God. Do this so they can know who you are. That's a different prayer. Oh, my God. If somebody could get this in your spirit, it would change the way you pray. It would change the way you pray, and it would change the way that heaven responds to your prayers. Lord, our God, deliver us from this land. So, God, deliver me from this court case. God, deliver me from this health issue. God, deliver me from these crazy kids. He won't deliver you, but he'll help you raise them. Deliver me from this financial stress. Deliver me from this. So, see, a lot of times our prayers stop before we get to the so. God, deliver me from this thing, man. Please, man, go, man. I can't do this. No, no, no. Deliver me so all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone are God. I, I, I don't pray, God, so I can get what I want. I pray so that. God can do this so people would know who he is. That's two different prayers. Look at the response. Now look at the response to the prayer, y'all. 2 Kings 19, 35 through 37. Remember what Isaiah said? God going to deal with that fool. Right? Watch this. 2 Kings 19, 35 through 37. Play so it sounds so much more spiritual. Please help me out, sir. That night, he put now. 
I'm going to fast forward you in the story, but Hezekiah prays his prayer. Then God, through prophet Isaiah, he responds. And just go read it. Like, like God is giving the Assyrians the read of their life in, in his response to Hezekiah's prayer. Right after that prayer, the Bible says in 2 Kings 19, 35 through 37, that night the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. When we got here to Miramar in 2019, the population of Miramar was 142,000. So imagine wiping out all of Miramar plus some. 185,000 guys like, you're done. Because you messed with my homie. I'm done. I'm done with y'all. Right? When the people got up the next morning, there were dead bodies. They were all dead bodies. Verse 36. Now, please, man, don't, hey, don't be praying this and be like, man, I hope my neighbor gone tomorrow. Don't be doing that. Don't be, don't be doing that. Don't be doing that. <laughs> you got to have fun in church. Huh? Verse 36. So, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew. He got scared. He was like, oh, snap. My whole squad gone? Okay, I'm out. He returned to Nineveh and stayed there. This is the messed up part. This is why you need to read your Bible. It's a movie. One day, while he was worshiping in the temple of his god, Nisroch, man, he just came to church just like y'all, but he went to his church. His son, Adramelech, and Sherezazer killed him with the sword, and they escaped to the land of Ararat, and Esar had and his son succeeded him. While he was praying at church, to his false God, his own sons killed him. That's why I like God, man. He petty. He said it's petty, but it's also intentional. I'm going to strike you down in front of the fake thing that you worshiped instead of me. Because I need you to know that your God had no power. Because if he did, he would have had the power to save you and he didn't. So I'm going to cut you down in front. Listen. Be careful about the things that you make idols because God will cut you down in front of it. Whole nother sermon. I ain't even got the time for it today. His army is destroyed while praying in the temple of his false God, his own son's killer, and take his place. And here's the best part. Hezekiah didn't have to lift a finger to fight the king of Assyria. All he did was pray to win. That's all he did. He prayed to win. Like, I want to pray prayers so bold that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that he is God and God alone. I want to, like, every time I pray, I want to put people on notice. So I cite God as my source. When I was a younger man and I was in high school and in college, I remember I used to have to write papers. Y'all remember you used to have to write papers? And when you write a paper, wherever you get information from or wherever you reference, what you have to do? You had to cite. I was listening to the radio during the last school year, taking my daughter to school, and it was a big topic of discussion because now kids are using AI to write their papers. Some of you are like, for, for real? I thought Johnny was smart. No. He's, he was smart enough to use AI. Johnny's using AI to write his papers. And the way that, one of the ways the teachers are trying to crack down on it is like it's forcing kids to cite your sources. If you can't tell me where you got this from, then I, I don't really believe you. They told you to cite your sources now and then because they wanted to make sure that your research 
was credible. And based upon the source that you said, it would dictate how credible the information was that you were putting out to the world. And I wish somebody would hear me today. That's why when I pray, I cite the source. I pray the name of Jesus because when I pray, I want to put the enemy on notice about who has the power and the authority over this prayer and I don't want the world to make a mistake about who my source is. That's why John 14, 12 says this. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do works I have been doing, but they will do even greater than these because I am going to the Father and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son and you may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. There is a name that makes demons tremble. There is a name that makes the enemy flee. There is a name that by that name and by those stripes, we are healed. I need to put the world on notice. So every time you hear me pray, I'm going to say, in the name of Jesus, the name that is above all names, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. Because I need everybody to know that I was never the source of my miracle and you were never the source of my miracle. But Jesus is the source of my miracle. So I cite the source when I pray I say his name because at that name every knee shall bow every tongue shall confess the whole world will know that Jesus Christ is Lord and when I pray to him I pray to win if you believe it say amen